Hello uh, and welcome to the CGC webinar series. This is the first webinar of 2023. Um, and we are going to open our webinar uh, series with Rowan Beck. She is going to uh, talk about how to use common workflow language on the CGC um, using our visual editor, as well as how to wrap your uh, own tool to run it on the Cancer Genomics Cloud. Rowan is a community engagement manager um, on the CGC. She has her PhD from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, and she is a, interested in regulatory mechanisms to underpin the association between environmental toxic exposures, diabetes, and phenotypes. Um, and she is um, highly computational, and she will be teaching you how to do all these cool things. So I'm going to let Rowan share her screen and take to it. All right, thank you for the introduction. Give me just a moment to uh, share my screen, get everything set up. Okay. Okay, let me make sure that this is large enough so that everyone can see. There we go. Awesome. So. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for that introduction. So welcome to the first Cancer Genomics Cloud webinar of 2023. Uh, I'm super excited to be kicking us off this year. So I will be explaining today how to create your own custom apps and workflows using our uh, workflow editor. So as Zilia mentioned, my name is Rowan. I work as a community engagement manager on the Cancer Genomics Cloud or the CGC. And I'm really glad to be here today showing off some of the cool features that we have uh, available for you. So just a quick little introduction, just to remind you guys, uh, the CGC is a high performance cloud computing environment. It allows users to quickly select workflows or tools to apply to use in their analysis, and you don't have to know how to code. That's the best part. So we offer over three petabytes of public data and over 700 tools and workflows to choose from. The tools and workflows can be easily browsed using our public apps gallery. Um, if you don't see a tool suitable for your work, you can join one of our 7,000 users to create a custom tool or workflow, especially after today's webinar. You can keep it for yourself or choose to share it publicly. Um, we already have about 80,000 user created workflows currently, so we're always looking to add more to that. Uh, taking a step back, the CGC is part of a larger ecosystem. Um, it's sponsored by the NCI Cancer Research Data Commons. So the CRDC is a cloud-based data science infrastructure. It provides secure access to large, comprehensive, and expanding collections of cancer research data. Users can explore and use uh, analytical and visualization tools uh, for data analysis on the cloud. So as always, you're welcome to visit our website to learn a bit more about the CGC. Um, it's cancergenomicscloud.org. Please stop by. We have links to past webinars, upcoming events, tutorials, and more. As a bonus, if you sign up for an account with the CGC, please let us know, and we'll add $300 worth of pilot credits on your account, thanks to support from the NCI. Just to give you an idea of how far $300 will take you, I received my $300 pilot credits early last year, and I still haven't used up all of my credits. We also offer office hours. So this is a space for you to come and chat with us about your research. Um, you can ask any questions that you might have or get some troubleshooting advice. We host these twice a week, 10 a.m. on Tuesdays and 2 p.m. on Thursdays. This is Eastern Standard Time. The links for our office hours is uh, available on the website, cancergenomicscloud.org, as well as we can put it in the chat for you here. All right, so for today, I will be going over custom workflows and apps. I've split this into two parts to make it easier for everyone. The first part is a live walkthrough of constructing a custom workflow on the CGC using um, already existing tools and apps. So I'll show you how to search for those. For the second part, we'll be creating a custom app of our own. So both of these parts utilize an underlying framework called Common Workflow Language, or CWL. You might have heard of CWL. It's a way to describe uh, various tools on the command line and then link them together. So I find uh, the schematic on the left here super useful for understanding and visualizing this. You'll start with an input. Usually this is your data. So this can be like a CSV file, FastQ, whatever. Uh, from here, you'll find the tools that you need to analyze your data. So that's what the steps box here is referring to. Um, these tools can be on the command line. 
They can be using uh, various JavaScript expressions, or you can combine some workflows. So commonly people will call, uh, they'll use like a shell script to call on an R script to do the analysis. That's an example of using sub workflows. From there, you'll have your outputs. So these can be either um, your analyzed data, like ready to present to your lab, or it could be data ready to put into our next step, which can be another workflow. So why do we use CWL? Mostly because it's platform agnostic. So that is a major benefit. What does that mean? It means you can put in R scripts, you can use Python scripts, JavaScript expressions, shell, bash commands, whatever you want, really. CWL allows you to combine, mix and match, customize, and use as many different tools as you want or you need. So you can make your workflow as simple or as complicated as it needs to be or as you want it to be. So this next slide shows you CWL in action. On our left is the same little schematic from before. And on the right, you'll see a real life example of a workflow on our platform. So we have our inputs, which in this case is labeled input file, as well as a reference genome. Next, we have our tools. So one is a Picard derivative for collecting metrics on whole genome sequencing. This could be any tool really. I'm just using this as an example. So we also have FastQ, uh, FastQC, sorry, and MultiQC. Lastly, we have the output um, file, which in this case is a multi-QC report. So please note on our platform, all our tools are colored this uh, blue-green kind of tealish color. Inputs and outputs are all gray. So this allows a user to easily differentiate between uh, inputs versus tools. So each item here has these little nodes where we can connect tools to inputs and outputs. So with our built-in workflow editor program is really as easy as just clicking and dragging. So I'll search you, uh, show you how to search for tools, but if you follow along with this animation, you can see someone just clicking and dragging a star genome generate tool, and then they select the little node and connect it to the existing star alignment tool, which is the bigger teal circle. They do this, um, like I said, by connecting the output port of the star genome generator to the input port of the star alignment tool. So now that you have the basics, let's move on to part one of this webinar. So this is constructing a workflow. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat um, or ask me, I'll do my best to answer. So for this portion, we're going to construct a workflow of our own. And are you guys ready to see what this workflow is that I've selected? All right, here we go. This is our workflow. So take a look for just a moment and try to remember what I said about input files and tools and try to identify which ones are the input files, which circles are the tools, and which ones are the outputs. All right, now that we've paused a second, let's break it down together. So this is a typical RNA-seq workflow. It utilizes Salmon. Uh, we have FastQC here and DESeq2. So the teal circles, as I mentioned before, are the tools. And then as you follow along, you can see various input files like a transcript FASTA, genome FASTA, FASTQ read files connect both to the salmon workflow as well as to FASTQC. And then we have output files coming out the other side of the tool. So to build a workflow like this, we're going to be needing a lot, we're going to need to be logged in to the CGC. And then once you're logged in and in a project, you'll select apps from the top banner below the blue. And then from here, you'll go to the right hand side and select create app. A new screen will pop up. And um, from here, you can select workflow, give it any name you want, and you'll be taken to our workflow editor. Don't worry if you didn't fully catch that, because I'm going to walk through it slowly and we can do it together. All right, so for this portion, I'm going to sign into my account. And uh, this webinar is being recorded, so visit us at cancergenomicslab.org. You can click on webinars and you can view it on your own time. You can follow along and try to create your own workflow. So I'm going to switch tabs here to the Cancer Genomics Cloud. And I'm already signed in. So this is what your main dashboard page looks like once you're signed in. On the left-hand side, you'll see uh, various projects. And on the right-hand side are recently completed analyses. You can scroll down. And on the left, you'll be uh, given access to our publicly available data sets. And on the right are some helpful tutorials and guides. So we have a quick start guide, you know, uh, information on how to create a project and so forth. 
If you keep scrolling down, you'll see a blue circle with a question mark in it. So if you click on this, you'll get context specific helpful links. So this uh, question mark is available on any of the pages uh, within our platform. So if uh, none of these links kind of answer your question, you can feel free to contact our support team. You can describe an issue, like it says, or share your ideas. They're really super helpful and friendly. So feel free to contact them and they'll get back to you right away. So once you are logged into the CGC, you go into a project. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, to do that, you'll create a project. So you can click on projects on the top left banner here, and then the green button, create a project. From here, you can give it a name. I can call it today's demo, for instance. And then you'll select your billing group. Again, if you uh, create an account with the CGC, you'll be given $300 worth of credits automatically from the NCI. And then you can turn on spot instances or memoization. I really encourage people to turn on memoization. So this is a feature where you have, if you have a really long workflow, complicated, multi-step, say for instance, it's 20 steps long and it fails on step 19. Uh, once this is turned on, it allows you to start from the last successfully completed step. So if it fails on step 19, you'll start back from step 19 and you don't have to start over from step one. So I like to turn this on. Um, as far as network access goes, if you are utilizing apps or, you know, R packages or things like that, that you don't want updated to the latest version, it's best to block network access. But if you are using something where you want it updated and you want it frequently, you know, updated to make sure it's the latest version, you can allow network access. Um, whatever you select, you can go back into your project anyway and alter after the fact. So once you're ready, you'll click create. And you'll be taken to a new dashboard page. So on the left here, we have our description section. So this is written in Markdown. You can easily edit it to give a description. You can have instructions for your lab, whatever it is you'd like to do. On the right-hand side, you'll see the members who belong to this project. So it's really easy to invite new members. For instance, I'm going to invite today Sarah, a colleague of mine. I'm going to give her only, let's say, copy access just for demonstration here. And once I click Invite, She's automatically added to my project. But today, we are going to focus on making a custom workflow. So to do that, you click on the Apps button. And then from here, obviously, we have no apps because we haven't created one yet or added any. But you can create your own. So click on Create App. And you'll be taken to this new window. Select Workflow. And we're going to name it something. Oops, sorry. We're going to name it Custom Workflow and click on Create, and you'll be taken to our Workflow Editor page. So the easiest way, in my opinion, to start creating a workflow is to just start adding the tools first and then worry about the inputs and outputs second. So you can search either for tools within your own projects if you have custom tools, or within the public apps gallery just by clicking on the tabs here on the top left corner. So if you recall, our custom tool involved a Salmon workflow, all right, I'm just taking the latest version, so 1.2.0, and dragging it. We also utilized a fast QC. So again, I'm taking the top one. And then we have DESeq2. And I'm clicking and dragging. All right, so from here, let's focus on one at a time. So for fast QC, we'll need the input file. So let's click and drag that out. We'll also be generating a report that is zipped as well as an HTML report. All right, for the salmon workflow, it's kind of the same thing. We have our transcript or salmon index file. And then we'll also need fastq read files. So that's the same as this uh, input file going into fast QC. So I'm just gonna click and drag that to connect. Notice how once I click on the output, um, output node on this input file, um, this one lights up in blue, kind of telling me where it connects. So from here, we will pull out the outputs. So we have transcript level quantification, the salmon quant logs that it generates, gene level quantification. Oops, sometimes if you get too close, they'll connect to one another, but you can just delete that and pull it out again. Salmon font. All right, we have expression matrix transcripts. And then lastly, we have expression matrix. Oops, again, sorry. Sometimes they do get a little too close. 
pull it out right here so that they are all differentiated. I'm gonna move this out of the way just so we can see a little bit better. All right, so on any of these apps, you can double click to be taken to the settings. So this is the Salmon workflow app. As you can see, we have FastQ read files as an input, as well as the transcript uh, FASTA or Salmon index file. We can also choose to turn on um, the genome FASTA as well as the GTF annotation. So you can select that. So I'm turning both of these on and notice how uh, a warning pops up saying this port is not connected. And that's because we haven't pulled them out yet. So make sure you go in and find the input files again and just drag them out. All right, so now we have done this and we just have DEseq to go. So again, you can um, double click on this just to see what kind of files are expected. You can choose to turn on a gene annotation file since we have the GTF right here. Um, expression data is required, so we can connect that. Let's keep on scrolling down just to make sure all the settings are correct. It's asking for a covariate of interest. Um, this is for ultimately later on once you're going to use the app. So for this, I'm just going to type in, I don't know, genotype just for demonstration purposes. And then lastly, it's asking what the quantification tool is. So you can choose to turn this on to exposed rather than default. And what that does is anytime someone goes to use your app, it'll give them a drop down menu here with choices. In this particular app, we're using the Salmon workflow. Um, your lab might use Callisto or string tie. It really just depends on what you're analyzing and how you choose to do it. But for this, just for demonstrative purposes, I'm using Salmon. So I'm going to turn that on and select Salmon. From here, I will close this. And now you'll notice there's a secondary input port here for gene annotation. So if we select back to our GTF annotation, it will connect here. And then we have expression data to connect. Um, I like to use transcript level quantification. Other labs can choose different ones. Um, I particularly like the transcript level quantification because I feel like you get, I guess, more information out of that. Um, you tend to have, you, you know, you pick up different isoforms. It really just depends on what your lab uses. I know a lot of people use STAR if they're looking for, you know, spliced uh, variants and things like that. But it really just, whatever your lab likes, that's the beauty of this is you can select and switch things out. So once we're ready, we'll pull out some of these DSeq output ports. So we have the phenotype file, normalized counts, oops, right here, and then lastly, an HTML report. So once you're ready, you can click save and give it a note, just so you know. Um, I can say that we have created the workflow for our revision one. Click on save. And then you'll see a no issues on the bottom here. Sometimes a warning will pop up, just you know, letting you know that you've connected something wrong. If this looks a little too messy for your liking, you can also click on this auto arrange button and it makes it look all pretty for you. I tend to have really messy looking workflows until I arrange it. Then you click save and run. And you'll be taken to a task page. So these are the inputs that we had set up. So we have the GTF annotation, genome FASTA file, an input file, as well as the salmon index. And then here is um, the setting that I showed you to turn on. So we can select what type of quantification tool we're using. Again, in this instance, it was just salmon but you know, your lab might use a different one. So um, for demonstration purposes, we can select some files to, to input here. And these files came directly from our public project. So if you go to the public projects on the top um, blue banner, you can click on bulk RNA-seq transcription profiling. And I basically just copied over those files into this project. I can show you how to do that. So I'm opening this in a new tab just to show you. If you click on the files tab of this public project, you can select whichever files you want and then click copy. And it'll ask you what project do you want to copy these to? So I copied them into um, a previous one and I'll show you what that looks like, but we can copy them into today's demo. And it takes just a few seconds. So let's go back here. And once you're ready to select the files, they should be available. So here's a GTF annotation file. 
we have input files that are required. I'm just selecting all rather than scrolling down. And then lastly, we need a salmon index file. So notice how all of these files are tagged, um, saving you the trouble of having to search for whichever ones you need. Um, we have selected salmon as the quantification tool. And then once we're ready, we'll click on run. And this is what it looks like. So it's queued up to run. I have run this already in a different project just to show you what the end results look like. So here we have the end results of this. And you'll see an output file. We have our DEseq analysis as a CSV. So this is like an Excel file with gene level quantification or transcript level quantification, I suppose. Um, we also have an HTML report that's generated. So you can click on this. It says DE analysis, so differential expression analysis using DEseq. Since it's HTML, you can open it up right in your browser and view what this report looks like. So it gives you some data about what type of samples you have, um, some exploratory analyses. So this is a PCA plot that is created, and I'll show you how to do this later on. We have some sample to sample clustering, as well as some histograms. So I'm not going to go too much into this data, but it's really easy to create an output report that you can share with your lab very quickly. OK, so for now, we're going to go back to our slides and check out part two of this. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to either interrupt me or put it in the chat. I'm happy to answer. So part two of this is creating a custom app on the CGC. So you saw how to create a custom workflow, but how do we actually create the tool, such as DEseq or you know, the SAM and alignment tool? Ours is going to be a lot easier than that, though. So for this, it's really a similar kind of concept. Uh, remember the schematic we saw early on. So we're going to keep it simple. We'll have an input file, which in the case I'm going to show you is a CSV. So that's just like an Excel kind of spreadsheet I'm going to show you. Um, we have our custom tool. And then finally, we will have an output file. So the data we are using today comes from an existing project on Toward Data Science. Um, we can send you the link in the chat. Uh, this was a project created kind of just to demonstrate what PCA is, which stands for Principal Component Analysis. And this user uses um, both data R as well as Python. Um, and he uses a breast cancer data set that originally comes from the University of Wisconsin. And this is a publicly available breast cancer diagnostic data set. It's hosted on the UC Irvine Machine Learning Repository, which again, we can share uh, the link with you in the chat. So the website, again, looks kind of like this. It's just toward data science. It kind of explains PCA in a different way. I'm going to go ahead and explain PCA as well. But if you want the link, we have this. And then let's see, the breast cancer data looks like this. So it's a data set. It contains um, the breast cancer data of 569 females or observations. And it, the dimensionality, sorry, of the data set is 30. So it means that there are 30 different characteristics for each uh, female in the data set. So the actual data set I have open right here. You give me just a sec to load this. As you can see, um, yeah, it's basically a CSV file. The number uh, represents 30 different characteristics just along the column names. Um, you can see it's a lot of data. So when presented with something like this, scientists often use something called principal component analysis, or PCA. And this is used to group the data and make observations. So here is a close-up of some of the observations, um, the characteristics, let's say. So we have mean radius, mean texture, area, um, things like this, just measurements for, um, for our, our females here. So as I said, principal component analysis, or PCA, is a statistical tool, and it reduces the, the complexity of the data set while preserving the covariance. So this is a kind of fancy way of saying it simplifies the data while still preserving the patterns. So I was searching for an easy way to explain this to different audiences, and I came across an example I'm going to show you in just a second here that I really enjoyed. So personally, I'm a big fan of music, and I thought this was a really great example. So 
As I said, PCA is a statistical method. It reduces the complexity of data sets while preserving the covariance, right? So imagine a big rock band with like 20 members. It has guitarists, background singers, pianists, keyboardists, a horn section, drummers, everything. A big band needs a big stage, right? Or like a big data set. But that's not always possible. So what do we do? Well, instead of three guitars, there could be one guitar. Um, instead of two drummers and a percussionist, maybe we could have bongos. Instead of a piano, we can have an electric piano or a keyboard. Uh, you wouldn't get the full, full detail of each song, but they could still be played and you get the general idea. So this is exactly what principal component analysis does. But instead of a band, we have a data set. Instead of players, we have various variables. And instead of a song, we have whatever the data set represents. So there's often um, redundant players, like having three vocalists. Sometimes you need them all, but mostly you can get by with fewer of them. So PCA rewrites the music so that fewer performers can still play the same song. And that was a really great way in my mind to understand PCA. So we're going to do that exact thing with our data set. So with PCA, the data can go from a huge spreadsheet of many different variables to a simplified plot that identifies the most important characteristics or principal components, and it differentiates data points along these components. So these variables that we're measuring all have an associated value to them, and as they relate to the principal components, um, so these values are called loadings. Here's an example. They describe how much each variable contributes to a particular component. So Large loadings, positive or negative, indicate that a particular variable has a strong relationship to a particular principal component. Um, the sign of a loading indicates whether the variable and principal component are positively or negatively correlated. And these are just examples. Um, this is not actual data here for texture and smoothness, for instance, but I thought it was an easy way of understanding that maybe area and radius uh, define the first principal component, for instance. So now that you guys understand PCA, we're going to go back to CWL. So to reiterate, we're going to make a really basic tool. This tool is going to read a data set and run a PCA on it. So the input file is going to be the breast cancer data that we just went over. Uh, the tool itself is going to utilize R. And lastly, the output file will be a PCA data report. So I've already uh, pre-built this custom tool and I'll be walking you through all of the parts. However, there is one thing I wanna to see together during the webinar, and that is to put in an extra input file. So this will be called report type, and it will allow the user of the tool to select what type of PCA data report that they want to generate. So let's go into a little bit more detail. Um, the most complicated part of this will be the tool itself. For this tool, I'm using uh, Docker to obtain an image of the required R packages. So think of Docker as kind of like a self-contained program that has all of the R packages and other things like that that we need. Then I've split the tool up into three steps. So there's an input uh, script in R, and this basically defines what the input file is. There's the analysis script in R. So this tells R to perform the PCA. And then lastly, we have the output report, which again is an R, and it tells R to take the script that we just ran with the PCA and publish it to either an HTML or PDF report. For this tool to work, we'll need to define our input ports and output ports. So for the input ports, um, we want to be able to click and select the data to be analyzed. So in our case, again, it's breast cancer data. And then the second input port defines what format we want the report to be in. So we also need to define the output port and tell it to spit out the analyzed data report. So again, for this portion, uh, I'll be using again cgc.svgenomics.com and I'll be walking you through. So back to the CGC again, this is the main area here. I'm going to click on webinar project where I've already pre-built this tool. I'm going to select the apps tab. And then from here, I will select the PCA tool. So once you're ready to take a look in the tool, kind of do a deep dive, you'll click on edit. And instead of a workflow editor, you'll be taken to a tool editor. So the very first thing you'll notice is we have here a uh, Docker repository. 
again, a Docker image is just an image that defines what types of packages we'll be needing to run our tool. Here I'm using Verse. Uh, the reason I'm using that one in particular is because it has really useful packages already installed for publishing a report, which is the goal of this tool. Scrolling down to the next section, we have um, the base command. So think of this as like a command line, basically. We are going to be running a, R script. So the first command, as you can see on the bottom, is R script. And then we're telling um, the command line to run this script here, output report dot R. And we'll get to that in just a sec. The very next thing here is asking where output report dot R will be found and where our, our files are, where the inputs are. So uh, if you scroll down just a bit, you'll see an input port. So this very first one here is input underscore CSV. And this is defining what type of data we expect a user to use for this tool. So in this case, it's going to be a file. Uh, I've named it input underscore CSV to make it very clear that we're expecting a CSV file here. Um, you can scroll down, you can select file type. Maybe if you want a different file type to be allowed, you can type that in as well. Um, say you want TSVs to also be allowed, you can add that easily. And then what I mentioned earlier is we are going to add a second input. So to do this, we'll click add an input. And we are going to name this one report type. Rather than a file, we want people to be able to select from a predefined set of options. So we are going to select enum here. And what that does is allow us to define what the options are. So under symbols, I'm going to type in either uh, PDF document or HTML document. And then that is all we need for this input port. We also have an output port, like I said, so we have to define the output as well. So the output is going to be a file, and we have the options of either an HTML file to be generated or a PDF file. So I've written this in the, the globe section, and globe stands for global. And what I'm doing basically is we're running the R script, and we want to collect anything generated from the R script that's either uh, ends in .html or .pdf. So it's going to collect anything that's generated ending in HTML or PDF, and it's going to, to put that out as an output report. Okay, so once we are finished with this, we can scroll down and we can set up um, hints if you'd like. This is a useful feature of our tool editor. So you can add a hint, for instance. Um, here you can select logs, and this is what I have set up basically. So what this says is it, is taking anything that has been run in R, so any type of R script, and saving it as a log file. So you can see exactly what was run. Uh, you can troubleshoot error messages, or if it ran successfully, you have a log of what exactly you typed in and how it ran. OK, and then for the file requirements, this is our tool itself. Remember how I mentioned we had three R scripts. We had an input R script, an output R script, and the actual script itself. So starting with the input R script, um, this is just defining where our input files are located. So you can click on this and you'll be taken to an expression editor. So uh, we are defining the path as inputs.input underscore CSV dot path. And the reason we are defining it as such is you can see on the right hand side, inputs is the object. Um, if you select input underscore CSV, the option here is path just below it. I've highlighted it. So the path is located here, path to the input.csv. Um, so once you type it in using the JavaScript editor or using the proper JavaScript expression, it will automatically um, replace this portion here with the actual path. And then report type, here we are defining it as um, the input.report type. So we're defining basically the input ports that we have set up. So again, report type is set to this right here, which is input and then report underscore type. And then once you type that JavaScript expression in, it automatically will look like this. It's using PDF document here as just kind of 
uh, a test example to show you what it would look like. So you can have PDF document or HTML document here. So your output report, actually, let's go to the script first. So the script many of you are probably familiar with. So this is just a typical R script. Um, here we have the source is the input dot R script. So remember how we defined where the data was that people will be putting in the CSV file. So that's what this is right here. It's sourcing that input R script to define the input data. So then we are calling that input data a data frame, and it is referencing the path that we defined in input.r. And we are telling it to perform a principal component analysis. So this is just a base R command, PCA equals print component on the data frame, and we're getting correlations out of this. So then to visualize it, I've installed the package GG Fortify. Um, this is just an extension of ggplot. It is just useful in plotting some common statistical analyses. It's really good for visualization. So I've chosen this package. You can choose any package that you're interested in. I just happen to know this one. So I'm installing ggfortify here and then calling on that library. And then basically just telling it to plot the PCA that we calculated in the previous step. Uh, I'm going to have the loadings on so that we can see what is contributing to those principal components, whether it's, you know, one or two along whatever axis. Um, from here, you can see uh, additional information about loadings, variance, and how much each of the characteristics um, is uh, influencing the, the principal components. Um, and that's what this PCA loadings command does. And then finally, we're just visualizing a uh, scree plot, which tells us where most of the, uh, the variance comes from. So that is the actual script in R. You can have this in Python, like I said. You can use a JupyterLab notebook. You can have a shell script, whatever it is you'd like. For this particular tool, we're just using R and sticking to it, since many people are used to R and are familiar with it. So lastly, we have an output report. And this one right here, if we expand it just a little bit, it's calling on the R Markdown library, which is just innate in R. Um, it's using the input.r um, script as a source, once again, to define what our data is, basically. And then it's rendering the R script that we just went over, the one where it actually tells it to do the PCA analysis and things like that. So it's rendering that as an R Markdown report. So the report type here represents whatever the user will select from the drop down menu. Click on save, and then you are ready to run this. So before we actually save this version, I'm going to go back and show you what this looks like if we were to run it as is. So this is the previous version. It has the data set it's asking for. That's our input. There are no app settings here. And then once we click run, it will generate an output report. Now that we have edited this to add an additional input port, let's save it. Added input port. And I will show you what this looks like now that we have altered it. So once you've saved it, you can click on run. Again, you'll be taken to a new task page. And notice how it's different now. So again, you can input your own data set. And it will ask you what report type you'd like, PDF document or HTML document. Awesome. So we can actually run this and see if it works. We can select our data set, which for this, I'm using the breast cancer data set here. I've used tags to differentiate it so I don't have to go searching. Save a selection. Um, for the report type, I'm just going to generate an HTML document so we can see it in the browser. And then I'm going to click on Run. So while this is running, I've previously run it so I can show you what the output looks like. Um, I'll just do this one. So once it runs, um, you can click on this output report and you'll get the HTML report that we generated. All of this is available to copy and move around to various projects. You can download it to your computer if you'd like. Um, but it basically will generate a, you know, an HTML report that's ready for presentations. Um, you have your plots and just however you want to do it. So the first portion here is just the R commands that we put in. It's sourcing the input, like I said, and it's reading the data frame and then conducting a PCA. From here, it's installing a library, GG Fortify calling on that library, and then this is the plot that is generated from GG Fortify. It's a bit messy. Um, you can go in and add your own scatter label 
distinction so that we can actually read this better. But the main idea here is that the data is being plotted and then all of these various characteristics are what are separating the data out, basically. So if you keep scrolling down, we have some information about um, the, the PCA variants. So the various dimensions here and how much they contribute to the variants. And then we have information about loadings. So um, what this tells us is basically Going down here are the various characteristics that we're observing, such as radius, area, smoothness, et cetera, and how much of these contribute to the various um, principal components. It's kind of hard to read the loading. So what I like to do is plot a scree plot, which uh, if we scroll down, we'll see here. And now the scree plot basically tells us that most of the variance between the 500 plus um, observations of females come from the first uh, principal component. So you can find out what exactly is contributing to the first principal component and 44% you know, of the variance comes from that. So if you combine the first principal component and the second, that and then you know one, two, and three, for instance, could explain up to 75% of the variance observed between our uh, subjects. So this is useful in clinical settings or diagnostics. If you you know you don't have time to look at every single possible um, characteristic that could influence a diagnostic, um, this will give you basically seventy five percent of the explanation and just the top three uh, principal components. And that's the whole purpose of principal component analysis, right? Is just to group things based on uh, simplified characteristics. So that is how we create our own custom app. I'm going to go back to the slides and give you some helpful uh, links here. So now you've seen what it takes to create a custom app or a workflow. You can try it out for yourself. Um, so here are links to the data sets and resources that I used in my talk. Um, we'll include them in the chat as well. But um, basically, I want to thank everyone. The TGC couldn't be here today without our collaborators. It's really easy uh, to create an account and join our community. So if you email us at cgc at sevenbridges.com, or you can even drop your CGC usernames in the chat, I'll add you to my project. Uh, you can use the PCA app I created as a template for your own research needs. You can modify it and do whatever you need with it. Um, you can also stop by office hours and you can uh, bring in your own custom tool and we'll show you how to customize it and how to tweak it to fit your analysis. So once again, the webinar is recorded. So visit us at cancergenomicscloud.org um, and you can click on webinars and you'll be able to view it on your own time and follow along and do whatever it is uh, you want to do. And we'll help you out as much as we can. That's what we're here for. So any questions at all, please feel free to type in the chat or you can um, reach out to me here and now. Yeah, maybe some, if you have any questions, you can unmute and just ask a couple of questions if you have any. And thank you so much for attending the webinar. We do have a comment on the side, on the chat saying this tool is incredible. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm glad it was useful. It's uh, a lot to fit into a webinar. So I really do encourage everyone to just try to create an account um, copy, or like I said, I'll add you to my project. You can use it as a template. That's the best way I have found to learn and how to customize is just to play with what already exists and change it around to fit your own needs. So I encourage everyone to really reach out. Um, I'm happy to share any of the resources or give advice. Yeah. I'm so glad that people found this informative, that the other comment we had is also a very informative webinar. webinar. Thank you so much. Um, like Rowan mentioned, this is going to be this is recorded and it's going to be posted. We'll share the slides as well on the on the website. Um, if you have any questions, reach out to us. And if you don't have any questions, I guess we'll uh, give everyone back 15 minutes and uh, we'll see you all next month for the CGC webinar series. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Bye.